Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on family seasons, the different times of life and events that happen in life that are part of the lives of many of us anyway. And this particular lesson is entitled Families of Faith. It's lesson number 11 in that series for June 15 of 2019. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we look now at the examples of some of these Old Testament heroes and think of what they went through and the challenges that they faced, and we want to learn from them how we can be faithful as Abraham and Esther and Daniel and others were. May we grow to be more like you each day, and especially as we study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How much does human culture affect your beliefs? Are they more, is human culture a bigger factor for you than God's Word? And how do we understand God's plan in light of human culture? What happens if what seems normal to us in our cultural setting seems to conflict with what the Bible says. Some of you may be aware that there are people who have decided to live for a whole year following the Bible principles in a modern city. And of course, they've taken everything very literally and are making fun of the Bible and about all the crazy things that they do, uh, presumably literally following the Word of God. That's not what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about people who look at the Scriptures, try to understand those people in light of their culture and then figure out how that applies to us in light of our culture. A good place to start is in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. As for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us. We have all these heroes from the Bible to to look back to. So then, let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and of the sin which holds, us, holds on to us so tightly, and let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross, and he is now seated at the right-hand side of God's throne. Wow. So, if we followed that, if every one of us followed that example, in, in that, those directions. Think how different things would be in the church today. We don't need to mention, I'm sure, the fact that culture affects almost everything we do from beginning to end. The way we feed our kids, the way we go about the process of, of, of enculturating our children, uh, the way we educate our children, and it, we, we could go on and on, thinking of all the ways in which our culture impacts us. Even, I might add, how we worship at church. Well, one of the very important ways in which we cultural ideas have affected us today, but cultural ideas from the past, is the change from Sabbath to Sunday. There's no scriptural evidence whatsoever for worshiping on Sunday, but how many Christians today are worshiping on Sunday? Almost everybody who calls himself mm -hmm. a Christian. Culture is not always negative, but often it is. No doubt that is because of the devil's work. So how do we become faithful and blameless while living in a culture that is absolutely committed to the devil's ways? Paul has some words about that in Philippians 2.15. So that you may be innocent and pure as God's perfect children who live in a world of corrupt and sinful people. You must shine among them like stars lighting up the sky. Wow. Stars lighting up the sky. That sounds like quite a challenge. Well, so let's be honest. Those of us who have been in the Adventist church for a number of years, some of us for all of our lives, recognize that the Seventh-day Adventist church is probably unique among Christian churches in, in, the, in that it continues to believe and act as if a worldwide church can come together and formulate common beliefs and doctrines and remain a unified whole from all the different countries in the world with all their different cultures and all their different ideas. 
And sometimes that's a real challenge, <laughs> as we know. Let me just give an example. I spent 17 years in East Africa. And some of the places we visited there, we discovered that the early Christian missionaries who came there, not just among Adventists, but against, uh, among other churches, would show up and they would stand up to preach on Sabbath in a suit and a tie. And this is tropical Africa. Yeah. Okay? Hot and humid. And hot and humid. And many of the local people got the idea, well, in order to stand up and preach, you have to have a suit and a tie. I hope we're not still living under those kind of crazy notions. But anyway, we have repeatedly discussed in our classes together the challenge that Jesus had in trying to get the Jewish believers, even his own followers, to reach out to people who are not Jews. If you read the story of Jesus in the Gospels, the only one, with, with one exception, I will say, that's John chapter 4, where Jesus, where John talks about the woman at Sychar, the well there. That's the only place outside of Luke where Samaritans or Gentiles or especially women are focused on. And why do you suppose that is? The others, the other writers were Jews. They were very strict Jews. Mm-hmm. And it was meant their that culture. It was their culture. It was their culture, yes. very patriarchal and very difficult for them to get beyond that. So think about the times, the things that Jesus did. What things did Jesus do in that short three and a half year, in fact, really down to about two years in time in which he was really publicly ministering? What things can you think of that Jesus did to specifically reach out to non Jews? We already mentioned one. The woman up in uh, Tyre of Phoenicia. Okay, the Tyre of Phoenicia woman, the, one of the old Canaanites people mm-hmm. that should have been gone a long time ago or, or converted a long time ago when the Jews came there. But he was, she was one of the old Canaanites. Yeah. Another one? The demoniacs at uh, Gadara. Yeah. What about those demoniacs? And the amazing thing is if you read the whole story and you put the whole Bible story together, you discover that Jesus... Across the across the Gal- Galilee, landed on the shore there, and here came these two demoniacs down there to attack him. I'm sure the devil was trying to keep Jesus out of that territory. They had what an hour or two with Jesus, and at the end of that encounter, Jesus said, "Okay, go back and tell your people what God has done for you." And the next time Jesus came to that area. Thousands of people came out to hear what he had to say. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amazing. That's what you get for chasing pigs into the water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other time, which wasn't specifically reaching out to Gentiles, very specifically, but Jesus took his disciples up to a place called Caesarea Philippi, way up sort of in the area of Golan Heights and so forth. And there amidst, surrounded by pagan temples and pagan sacrifices and pagan altars, that was the place where Jesus asked them, who do you say I am? And where Matthew made that statement, you are Jesus' son, son of God and so forth. Those things all happened in pagan territory. Well, you had the, the the Greeks that came looking for Jesus yes. at the Passover yeah. also. Yeah, and that's a very appropriate time. I was thinking about times where Jesus specifically right. reached it out. Was, I know it was the other came way to around. Him, yeah, but, yeah but. very good point. Good point. Curious that you said that almost all of these are in Luke, but the references that you have listed yes. are all non-Luke references. <laughs> yeah, but, but if you look at those things, yeah, that's true. If you look at those passages... Most of them are in Luke also. Many of them are in Luke also. And they... Anyway, I, I don't have time to go to explanation. But just, if you, if you look through Luke, you find out... Take the stories of the Samaritans. How many Samaritan stories are there outside of Luke? Only the woman at the well. John 4. John 4. And we've looked at Rome, Acts 8... 
one to three many times about the role of women. In fact, the early Christians... Luke 8, one to three. Did I say... X. I'm sorry, Luke 8, one to three. Thank you. In fact, the early Christians, many of them rejected the gospel of Luke for hundreds of years because it was way too favorable toward women. Mm, really? Yes. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, think now about Acts chapter 10 and the story of Cornelius. Now, let's think just for a moment. What do we know about Cornelius? Roman centurion. He was a Roman centurion. And he was very popular with the Jews, right? Yes. Roman centurions in general, let's talk about them first. They were the enemy, weren't they? In general, they were the enemy. But here was a Roman centurion who lived in the headquarters of the Roman government for that part of of the country. And what do we know about him? Well, it says here that he was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout man who Mm -hmm. feared God, Mm -hmm. who feared the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. He as did his entire household. So here's a Roman centurion that came obviously from Italy, came here probably to serve a tour of duty, and discovered the Hebrew kind of worship and was attracted to it. And really, really said, that's what I want, that's what I'm interested in. And what happened? We know that one time when he was kneeling and praying in his house, an angel appeared to him. And he was shocked, and the angel said, send for Peter, you know all the details. He sent off three men, they went down there to Joppa, and they found Peter and staying in the house of Simon the Tanner. And uh, that also makes you wonder about that, because... Do good Jews stay in the houses of ha- tanners? I wouldn't no. think so. No, because every they're continually dealing with dead animals. That means that they're perpetually unclean. How could how could Peter then go to his house if? I mean, maybe I, I, they maybe they used canvas or something. Maybe they used <laughs> <laughs> didn't use skins. <laughs> no, no, no. They were skins. Were they? But what what Peter did? What well, the story with Peter here probably is that this Simon was probably a Christian, and even though he was, you know, Peter was constrained by some of those early Christian, I mean, early Jewish beliefs. He was probably the person who offered him a place to stay, and he managed to set aside some of his cultural things, and that's really what we're talking about now. So he could stay with Simon. We don't know for sure. Maybe someday we'll find out. But I'm best yeah, asking. It, when they were, like Paul was a tent maker. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did they use? That would be, some. sometimes that would be skins as well. Now remember, the tanner isn't just dealing with skins that have already occurred and all that kind of stuff. He's dealing with animals, skinning the animals and so forth. Mm-hmm. That's the part that would, that would make you impure, not, not having a belt on. Or, or smell. Yeah, and the smell, yeah. Well, when Peter went left from Joppa to go back with these men, he took several other Christians with him. Why did he do that? Witnesses. Witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> he said, this is, this is a scary journey. I better have some witnesses. And we know that what happened. He, he got up there to Cornelius' house. He showed up at the front door, and Cornelius wanted to bow down and worship him. And what did Peter say? Get up, get up, get up. <laughs> not just a person like you. Come on in. And what had what had Cornelius done in preparation? He he had gathered his friends, his household. Why his a friends, gathering of gathering, people? Yes, relatives and close friends. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And Peter began to preach to them. And what happened? The Holy, Holy Spirit s- fell. The Holy Spirit the Holy came Spirit down. Fell on them. Wow. And just as he did on us in Jerusalem. Notice those very important words. And what do you do when God says, I accept these people? You better accept them too. (laughs) You better accept them too. And when Peter got back in Jerusalem, what happened? They said, rumors have it that you were in the house of a Gentile. Mm Mm-hmm. And Peter says, yeah, and there's six more of us right here, my witnesses. And what did we see? We saw the Holy Spirit come down on them just as he came down on us. And I'm sure that there were a lot of Christians there yeah, with their mouths hanging open. 
That's impossible, they said, or they thought. That was their initial thought. Well, anyway, that was the beginning of a revolution, we might call it. Well, we have suggested, and we still believe today, of course, that the death of Christ on the cross answered the questions in the great controversy and dealt with Satan's accusations. And those, those things are, are valid not just for Jews, but for Gentiles. Those answers are just as good for Gentiles as they are for Jews. So we have something about that. And Paul had some words to say about that. Kerry, you want to help us there? Yes. This is Romans 3, 1 to 4. Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles, or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true, even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Wow. That's from the Good News translation of the Bible. Yeah. <clears throat> Amazing. God is on trial. Not just us. This is not just about the time when God judges us. Every one of us makes a choice ultimately to choose Satan's side or God's side. So God and the devil are both on trial before the universe. Well, mm. Ellen White had something to say about that. Margaret? It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption that Christ bore the penalty in behalf of the human race. The throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure, even though the race may be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. By the sacrifice of Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled, and the human race would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by the satanic agencies, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. And I interrupt there for just a second. That has to be the final conclusion to the great controversy and God cannot bring things together to a conclusion until that happens every single person wicked righteous heavenly angels Satan's angels everyone has to finally agree that God did everything he could to bring this whole and everybody agreed God will, will say God did did it right sorry thank you in making his infinite sacrifice Christ would exalt and honor the law he would make known the exalted character of God's government, which could not in any way be changed to meet man in his sinful condition. This is from Ellen G. White, Signs of the Times, July 12, 1899. Paragraph Gary, 2. Where, where was she when you wrote those words? In Australia. In Australia, right. Yeah. You need to speak up there. <laughs> well, in the was, homeland. In the homeland, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And her house is still there. They, yeah. They did it oh, up. Wow. Yeah. So many of our Christian friends believe that the gospel is all about how God saves me. And, and you too, of course. But the gospel is really about telling the truth about God, his character, his government, and seeing what a contrast it is to the character and government of Satan. But being egocentric people we, as we are, this is a difficult message for us to understand. I mean, you know, if, if, if someone could just put it straight, okay, here's God, this is what he's like, and here's the devil, this is what he's like, you would think everyone would choose God's side, right? And what do we know from the Bible? What does it tell us? Is everybody going to choose God's side? Oh, no. Nope. Very few. In the Revelation, they, they curse God. Mm -hmm. Instead of repenting, they curse him. Yep. And of those intelligent heavenly creatures only two-thirds stayed loyal to God yeah which is amazing yeah, yeah. the perfect atmosphere. Is amazing exactly yeah. amazing is right you know here is God is you know I don't know but I I, uh, I don't know obviously I'm not an angel 
But it seems to me if Satan came around, or da- the Lucifer in those days, and said, did you know, blah, 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 you know God is not fair, blah, blah, all this kind of stuff, wouldn't you go to God and ask a few questions? Yeah. You said you were an angel, but as angel means messenger, and yeah. do we not have a message? That's Everybody true. should have a message. In fact, Ellen White was referred to, she says, my job is not that of a prophet, it's that of a messenger of, of the Lord, Malat Yahweh. So, anyway, we should all yeah. be searching for a message. Yeah, we, we need the message, that's true. Interesting, as you sort of Im- implied there in your, your bit of Hebrew, the word Malachi means my messenger. And Ellen White called herself God's messenger. So, maybe we should call her Malachi. Mm-hmm. I think that the, yeah, I think the the reason that a third that Satan was not an actor and overdoing the acting, he yeah. was very subtle, mm-hmm. and the lies were full of truth, with just a little bit of off color. So, it makes you think about us and where we are. Um, that there's civil silver tongued devils. No, oh, absolutely. And we see them all around us. But I think Lucifer was greatly loved, or he couldn't have done that. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Just yeah. like well, God he was, is loved. He, yeah. When he started spreading his message, they said, well, this, this, this guy just came from the throne of God. What he's saying to us must be true. Yeah. And also, that's a, a evidence of the freedom that God gives all intelligent creatures. God doesn't up rule through force, fear, intimidation, coercion, extortion, duress, etc., Mm-hmm. It's freedom to choose, mm-hmm. and you don't exercise that freedom with a threat of a sword hanging over your head or yeah. or dangling over the. Remember that picture of was Jonathan Edwards? Jonathan you know, Edwards, you hang, sinners hang in the back. hands of an angry God. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, God has always been that way, and He will remain that way. Yeah. Well, is He trustworthy? You know, that's yeah. the thing, because sure. Jesus came to do the will of the Father, and the basic. Luciferian doctrine is do thy own will. Yeah. So I'm sure that's the the avenue that Satan took was, yeah. uh, you know, we're we can make decisions for ourselves. We yeah. don't have to bring everything to God. We can. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that vote of the heavenly universe initially, it was one third that were willing to stick their necks out and say, I believe Satan. Mm-hmm. The others, Ellen White tells us. We're not so sure, not sure enough to go in Satan's court, but they had questions yep. until at least the time of Abraham and probably until the cross. Yeah, That's an indication as to why this earth was created, to answer the questions of the two-thirds that did not rebel. They still, they heard all the charges, I they assume. They still had questions. They, they had to see the evidence, and it wasn't until the time of the cross that they were settled. In, in well, the another mountain. huge... Another huge step in the progress of trying to get the gospel out to the Gentiles happened in Antioch. Incredible as it may seem, after Stephen was killed, the Christians scattered. And a little bit later, some of them from Libya, a place called Cyrene in Libya, and others from Cyprus came to Antioch, which was the third largest city in the Roman Empire in those days, and began to spread the gospel directly to Gentiles. And the church exploded in, in, in activity. And guess what happened? The stalwarts down in Jerusalem had to figure out what was going on up there yeah. at Antioch. And they sent people up there. And what happened? Well, yeah. we better get together and talk about this, folks. Is this okay or isn't it okay? Yeah. They, yeah. yeah. Well, well, how are they going to deal with it? You know. Yeah. Were they going to be just like they have to go through Judaism in order to get to Christianity? Or that was that was the issue, yeah. Well, that's spelled out in Acts 15. We don't have time to read all that, but you know that Peter finally st- stood up and gave a speech, and others, Paul gave his speech, and so forth. And finally, James, the elder, the stepbrother of Jesus, who was obviously acting as the chair of the place, and stood up and said. My conclusion is, and they gave that conclusion, which you can read about it in Acts 15, 28, and 29. Well, it's normal for cultures really around the world, basically, to 
consider family units and family ties as being very important. We as Christians should be very thankful for that. Unfortunately, a lot of strange beliefs have crept into the Christian church because of cultural ideas that have predominated in the past. Um, Jesus had some words to say about that. Look at John sixteen thirteen. When, however, the Spirit comes, who reveals the truth about God, he will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of things to come. Is that to suggest that... Uh, he will uh, lead us away from our, some of our cultural backgrounds, maybe. Well, the, we know that the United States was founded, or, or the, the people who came here and founded the government, which they have at the present time, came here to do what? To escape what they consider to be faulty Perse- Christianity. Yeah, persecution. Yeah, escape persecution. People, some of their friends were killed before they finally got on the Mayflower and came to to Massachusetts in those days. But well, even coming here, they didn't. They continued to uh, have some of the same ways in their heart, yes. and that's when Roger Williams had to split off and found Rhode Island Colony yep. so that there could be true religious freedom mm-hmm. and, and expression. So, how well are we doing today at making things free and? letting people be free. and Is our government today closer to true Christianity than our founding fathers were? Mm, that's a tough question, huh? Yeah. Well, well, it depends on whether we maintain the uh, constitutional republic where the minority have rights as well. Uh, yeah. You get to where it's a pure democracy, as some people are trying to head it, then the the minority doesn't have any rights, and the, yeah. the majority can roll roll over them, yep. and force them to to do. And the it sure seems like we're headed in that direction. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go back to Abraham. Abraham has always been described as the father of the faithful. He grew up at a place called Ur of the Chaldees, and we don't have time to go into a great deal about that right now, but. There's a city called Urfa in southeastern Turkey that will show you, if you go there, the birthplace of Abraham. Um, We know that typically Christians have taught that Ur is in southern Iraq. That happened because someone back in the early 1800s went down there and began just digging to see what he could find, and he found a piece of something that had the word Ur on it. He said, oh, this must be the home of Abraham. That was all the evidence he had for that fact. There was nothing more than that to support that idea. There is very good evidence that the, the home of Abraham was actually was in southeastern Turkey. And if you read Ellen White carefully, and she talks about how they crossed the, the Euphrates River, etc., it supports the idea that he came from southeastern uh, Turkey. But Abraham wasn't traveling alone, was he? No, no he, he had many people with him Slaves, many, many people. Family. They they traveled to Haran, and what happened to his family in Haran? Do you remember? Well, they settled there for a while yep. until his father died. His father passed away, and he said, "Okay, it's time to move on again." And down they went to Canaan. And we know when he was in Canaan that at one time he went and fought a war with three hundred and eighteen trained soldiers who were working for him. What do you suppose 318 trained soldiers did for him? Watch sheep. And guarded his guarded sheep. His sheep cattle. cattle, almost certainly. And I mean, imagine was, that. Well, they could have defended against marauders or they sure. could have uh, wild animals, but they sure. could have practiced while they were sheep or grazing. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't watch sheep and be a trained soldier. They uh, agree with that. Just think they were men of courage. I'm not sure about yeah. being a soldier. <laughs> Well, that's what the Bible says. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he he, he beat he beat the, those five kings that had come and taken everything from the Jordan Valley and took taken a lot in his family with them and so forth. And Abraham with his 318 beat them, defeated them. Of course, he had God on his side. That might make a difference. Kind of like Gideon mm-hmm. with how many people? <laughs> 300. Yeah. 
defeated a massive army. Uh, Alan White says at one time, uh, well, he, he said in Abraham in his home there in Canaan, he led in, in, in acts of worship the people who, who were working for him, sometimes as many as a thousand souls. Wow. There. Wow. Big family. Well, many strange customs have developed down through the ages and then have been considered essential to be a part of a recognized family. In one ancient culture, a man was expected to eat the corpses of his dead parents. Mm. In another culture, a man who wanted to marry had to bring his father, bring her father, a dowry of shrunken heads from a rival tribe. Did any of you gentlemen have to do that to get married? I sure didn't. So what cultural influences are impacting our lives today and the beliefs we share in our worship communities? Well, TV and movies propagate wow. things and there's a high rate of divorce even amongst Christians. Uh, different views on marriage and sexuality. and. Yep, exactly. Well, Abraham and Sarah had been promised when Abraham was 75 years old that they would have a child. And they waited. And they waited. And they waited. And Sarah stopped having periods. And the promise hadn't taken place yet. So what did they decide to do? Let's help God. Now God needs lots of help. <laughs> well, sadly, they welcomed Hagar into their family and we're living with the consequences ever since. Well, it's interesting to notice that when Jacob was down living in the area of Hebron and decided it was time to move back to the area of Bethel, uh, God said, please, before you move back there, gather everyone around, collect all the idols that they have in the household and bury them before you move back to Bethel so you can worship God there correctly. But you they know. didn't do it. Hmm? They didn't do it, did they? Because Rachel... Well, was this, Rachel was before this. This is after Rachel. I believe. You're I'm talking sure. about the time when Rachel was hiding the... Yeah. Now, that was, that was back when J Jacob came from the house of Laban and so forth, way, way back earlier. But, I mean, that's what, that's a, that idol probably had to go. Yeah. One of the ones that probably got buried under that tree. Well, you can go down hundreds of years later to the times of Ezra and Nehemiah, and now people have come back, a small, small percentage, one or two percent of the Jews return from their foreign places of living to try to reestablish themselves in Palestine. And what happened? They married foreign wives. They married foreign wives. Wow. They, they didn't bring enough women with them. I don't know if that was a problem, but it, whatever the problem was, I mean, it, the thing is, if you come to the second time this happened, re, as recorded in Nehemiah 13, well, let me just read that. Nehemiah 13, 23 and 24. At that time, I also, this is talk, Nehemiah speaking, I also discovered that many of the Jewish men had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half their children spoke the language of Ashdod or some other language and didn't know how to speak our language. How can you claim that you're bringing your children up in honor of God if they can't even speak your national language? They're, they're speaking the languages of these pagan nations around them. So, of course, these two men, Ezra and Nehemiah, tried twice to get these men to separate from these foreign wives, and they were semi-successful. Well, who was the famous person before that had done such a marvelous job of marrying foreign women? Solomon. <laughs> Solomon and his 700 wives and 300 concubines. Wow. Ellen White tells us that even in the days of Jesus, there were sti still there were still rubble, parts of buildings left from the pagan temples that Solomon had built on the Mount of Olives for his wives to worship their pagan gods. Unbelievable. 
he let them worship their pagan gods, he did not convert them to Judaism. Well, he, I'm sure he thought that his sterling example would convince them to become like him. His silent witness. <laughs> his silent witness. <laughs> oh, boy. So how can we live in our culture and not be sunk in it? Not be drawn away on it, in it? What things are particularly helpful and to family life and harmony with the Bible? And what things are not? Well, polygamy is illegal now. <laughs> so we're not as... At, I mean, there are pockets where Mormons still do uh, practice polygamy. Mm-hmm. But we have other things like uh, homosexual marriage that creates a barrier for... And we've seen legal challenges where uh, people have been pushed in their belief system to, to cave... And uh, uh, they've been defended so far, but there seems to be a sort of a vendetta. There are people now serving in the U.S. Congress who believe that every religion should be treated as equally valid, including atheism. In fact, there's some, just in the recent elections we had, that say that no one who want, anybody who joins Congress should not declare that he belongs to any church group. A significant number of members of Congress, when they filled out their application for, for Congress, refused to put down that they belong to any religion. A significant percentage. I heard something very interesting today. Um, They said that in 2008, Barack Obama made the statement that he supported marriage between a man and a woman. Today, that would disqualify him for running for president, which is... In some lots of circles. Well, in the... Well, yes. Well, it illustrates something in Proverbs. Change. Under three things, the earth quakes, and under four, it cannot bear up. Under a slave, when he becomes king, a fool, when he is satisfied with food. Under an unloved woman, when she gets a husband, and a maidservant, when she plants or supplants her mistress. So somebody who's been repressed wow, yeah. for a long time, once they get power, they can be yeah. uh, hard to deal with. Yeah. Well, think of the impact that evolution has had on our schools. Oh, yeah. It's very interesting to observe the traditional, the, the usual media here in the United States. And, you know, it's all evolution until all of a sudden there's a national crisis. And then it's, we all need to pray. Yeah. Who are we going to pray to? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to the salamanders or which, which of our predecessors? <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. Well, we all have to admit that change is inevitable. I mean... Every day, some kinds of changes happen. It's been the story of mankind from Adam and Eve until the present day. And some things are clearly, some kinds of changes are clearly predictable aging, marriage, death. Others are completely unpredictable natural disasters, war, illnesses which come suddenly, or sometimes unexpected family moves or career failures. What do you do? Well, look at the message that Abraham got when he first was called by God. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home, by the way, because they were already adopting pagan customs, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations." When Abram was 75 years old, he started out from Haran, as the Lord had told him to do, and Lot went with him. Abraham took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the wealth and all the slaves they had acquired in Haran, and they started out for the land of Canaan. So quite a gathering. How old was he when he left Ur and went to... We don't know for sure. We, we it wasn't 75. No. It's later. It was 75 when he left. He was there for a while. Yeah. Well, from the book of Genesis and more so from the from the writings of Ellen White, we know that Abraham's immediate family was adopting heathen practices. Do you think we would ever have heard of Abraham if he had, le- had not left Ur? 
He would have, no. Abraham might have remained faithful, but his descendants would have faded into the culture, I'm sure. We would never have heard of them. So this is another time where God stepped in and said, I will take this family, this group, and transplant them like he did at the time of the flood Mm -hmm. and again with Abraham. Yes. Then again he moved... The children of Israel? The children of Israel. That's not only. The only time he he took Jacob and his children down to Egypt because they were rapidly becoming... And Ellen White says this very specifically, God had to take them down there and he had to take them down there into a culture where they despised what they did. In other words, they despised shepherds. The the Egyptians did. The Egyptians did. And that kept them as a more or less separate unit and and managed them to grow our nation. Otherwise, they would have just melted into the Egyptian culture. Well, think about Esther now. We know her story. Um, Her parents were dead. She was kept by her cousin. She was obviously a beautiful young woman. She was chosen in that beauty contest. Ended up being married to that king. Think how different things could have been. What if what if she had not been there to, to pray for the children of Israel? What if Mordecai had not been chosen to become prime minister? <laughs> Think of all the things you know about the stories of Daniel and his three friends. What if Daniel had not been brave enough to insist on a healthier diet? And was it a healthier diet he insisted on? It yeah. happened to be a healthier diet. Yes. But that what, wasn't probably, it wasn't, a, probably wasn't the only reason why he chose that diet. He chose it primarily because it wasn't, hadn't been offered to the pagan gods. And therefore, in his success and the friends of his friends, their success, they were recognized as not as servants of the pagan gods of Babylon, but the, but, but the gods of Israel. And something else that we sometimes don't think of, people were called from all over the Babylonian Empire to come to that plain and bow down to the idol. Do you think there were any other Jews there besides the three young men? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Almost certainly. And what were those other Jews doing? Bowing down. Bowing down. down. Yeah. Maybe they arranged to be gone on business kind of like Daniel apparently was <laughs> maybe some of them well because Daniel and his three friends remain faithful we have the, the book of Daniel and with those incredible time prophecies that carry us all the way down to 1844 which is such an important date for us and our pioneers in the Seventh-day Adventist Church we need to remember of course at that point in time Daniel and his friends were almost certainly still teenagers or at the very most early 20s when those things happened to them. Incredible. Torn from their families, carried to a foreign nation that was... And all the people around them believed that your gods are useless. I mean, look at you're a conquered nation. You, you know, Babel, the, our God Marduk has, has conquered your God. Why are you, why are you sticking with that old God? You know? I mean, how how would you live with that kind of a... Well, it has been carefully studied by sociologists and proven time and again that when there's a major change in one's cultural setting, the upset makes him or her more vulnerable to take on new ideas, new cultural ideas, and new attitudes. Many people at such times have chosen to join a new church. Others have stopped going to church completely. So are we as Seventh-day Adventists reaching out to new people and move into our communities? Because those are the people who might more readily join a new church. Um, Think of people who've gone through various kinds of trauma. We need to be reaching out to them. Well, in the book of Judges, we read some very sad news. I won't have time. We don't have time to read the whole section there, but... When Joshua stood up and gave his final speech to the children of Israel, he said, you kids can do what you want, but I'm going to stay faithful to God. Oh, yes, yes, we'll be faithful to God. And then we come to Judges 2, we find out what? That as soon as Joshua and all those of his generation passed away, they were busy joining the the, the pagan gods and adopting their customs. Assimilating. Yeah. Jim, I think you have something about that. 
Studies of how values and beliefs in organizations such as churches are transmitted to subsequent generations show that the founders have very high levels of commitment to the beliefs. They were the ones who first championed them. Within a generation or two, many lose sight of the principles behind the values. They may go along with the organization, but often from habit. In subsequent generations, habits tend to crystallize into traditions. The founder's passion is no longer present. How's That's a that? note from June 12 in our study guide. Yep. Wow. Well, considering all that we have just looked at, some scholars have suggested that God has no grandchildren. What does that mean? Only children. The only children. We Why? each we each are a child of God. But only those that have direct contact with God. Yes. Not we secondary need, contact. Yeah. We need to have personal, direct relationship yes. with God if our faith is going to remain vibrant and alive. If not, it flickers and dies. So how do we pass along our faith to our children? We've talked about some of the suggested ways in previous lessons. Uh, but Deuteronomy even said parents must instruct their children not only by organized classes. For example, we could send them to an Adventist school or teach them ourselves at home, homeschool them. But we also need to teach our children by our example. Everything we do, they need to see that, you know, they need to see a sermon, which is more powerful than hearing one any day, as a famous poet mm-hmm. once said. Um, we cannot make our we cannot make ultimate choices for our children. They'll make their own choices. Well, I was just thinking of hymns who always brings up that God is a teacher, mm-hmm. and parents are teachers. Yep. But God does not force, and neither can parents. That's right. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, the message translation is a para- paraphrase, really, of the Bible by Eugene Peterson. He translates the word euangelion in Greek as gospel or I mean that's what it usually means is gospel or good news using the word message that is the message that needs to go to all parts of the world in our day so what is involved in that message well look at this particular passage particularly 2 Corinthians 5 18 to 21 all this is done by God who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us a task of making others his friends also That is, or should be, our main job. Our message is that God was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us a message which tells us, tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ, as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was without sin, But for our sake, God made him share our sin in order that in union with him, we might share the righteousness of God. Wow. So in the Matthew 28 passage there, in final words to his disciples, it is interesting to notice that according to the cultural norms of that day, the all-male disciples did not believe what the women said when they spoke the message of the resurrection. The women had gone first to the cave, to the, to the grave, remember. They mm-hmm. found it was empty. They raced over to tell the disciples. And they didn't believe them. And the disciples said, Yeah, you're just a bunch of women. You don't know what you're talking about. You're hysterical. Hyster- <laughs> hysterical, that would be the right there, word. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And think about the fact that Jesus appeared first of all to whom? After the resurrection? Mary. To Mary. Okay, <laughs> let me let me ask you, how many general conference committees do you think would have chosen to give the best news of all time to a former prostitute, demon-possessed woman? <laughs> they would not have let her in the door. <laughs> they would not have let her in the door, is right. Much less listen to her. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, fortunately... In fact, do we even listen to women oh, in the church? It's hard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but John and Paul had completely you know it's strange that some of us really believe in Ellen White 
Hmm. That is ironic. <laughs> Both John and Paul had complete confidence and faith in the truth of the Christian message. They realized that that message was intended for every single person living on planet Earth. It involves not only the forgiveness of our sins, but also plans to completely transform each of us to become like Jesus Christ himself. That's what God would like to see. Well, think of Paul, particularly. He was one of the real pioneers who went out there, the first one to preach in some major pagan cities. What do you think attracted people to him? Why would they come and listen to him? Why would they decide to become Christians? Well, he tried reason, but in the end he said... uh that he would simply lift up Christ, preach Christ and him crucified. Yeah. Okay, but what was the rest of that story? And Christ, Christ and him crucified, but he, he rose himself from the grave and Christians after that also had resurrected other people from the dead. I suspect that that was one of the things that really grabs people's attention. I may well, be wrong. Hill, when he yeah. spoke of yeah. the resurrection, it, they, they sort of cut him off and yeah. said, well, we'll talk about this later. Yeah. When, when Jesus raised Lazarus, uh, they, uh, they plotted to kill, Jesus, uh, kill Lazarus and then went ahead and plotted to kill and, and did uh, yeah. Jesus. Uh, so... Well, this was a... This, when you have a, a man who'd been dead walking around... That was absolutely anathema to the Sadducees and their beliefs. Prior to that, the Sadducees had thought, well, this Jesus guy, he's going to eventually blow over and it will be gone. But when he started doing that kind of stuff, they said, they joined the Pharisees, we've got we to gotta do something about this guy. Hmm. Think of what we know about those early Christians. They opened their homes. You know, they had to meet in the courtyard of the temple because there were no buildings big enough to, to house them. So they met in the courtyard of the temple, but then they would go home to their individual homes and they welcomed people into their homes. They, they were like a, a big old family. Um, and they recognized that no different. Of course there were differences between them, different ideas and so forth, but none of those differences were as important to them as the gospel, the good news that they shared. They believed in what Jesus said in his prayer in John 17 about how this should all come together. So is there any new reason why we couldn't have that kind of excitement in our churches today? Paul was so excited about the gospel that he said it's like a fire burning in my bones. I can't keep quiet about it. So how can we be better sharers of the gospel? Doesn't the whole world need to hear our message? We're told that, aren't we? Mm-hmm. We need to set aside our prejudices and reach out to anybody who's willing to listen. Dennis, I think you've got some words about that. It is true that we are commanded to cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins, Isaiah 58.1. This message must be given, but while it must be given, we should be careful not to thrust and crowd and condemn those who have not the light that we have. We should not go out of our way to make hard thrusts at the Catholics. Among the Catholics are many who are most conscientious Christians and who walk in all the light that shines upon them, and God will work in their behalf. Those who have had great uh, privileges and opportunities and who have failed to improve their physical, mental, and moral powers, but who have lived to please themselves and have refused to bear their responsibility are in greater danger and in greater condemnation before God than those who are in error upon doctrinal points, yet who seek to live to do good to others. Do not censure others. Do not condemn them. If we allow selfish considerations, false reasoning and, reasoning and false excuses to bring us into a perverse state of mind and heart so that we shall not know the ways and will of God, we shall be far more guilty than the open sinner. We need to be very cautious in order that we may not condemn those who, before God, are less guilty than ourselves. Testimonies of the Church, Volume 9. Wow, that's a challenge. How so, good so of being a, an error in the doctrine is not the worst thing? 
Not the worst thing. Not the worst thing. Yeah. How are we doing in reaching out to people of other faiths and even to our children and sharing the, the good news with them, even our grandchildren? Almost down through his, always down through history, pretty much. When Christians have, have joined together, they tend to sort of naturally divide out into what we call conservatives and liberals. The conservatives think that they need to give up almost anything that has to do with local culture and be very strict in the Christian way. It's hard for them to reach out to people of the world. On the other hand, the liberals find that cultural things are very important and they sort of get as close as they can to the to worldly people. Sometimes it's difficult to tell them apart from the people of the world. But we know, uh, you can read, for example, Romans 2.11, Acts 10.34, and Galatians 2.6, God is absolutely opposed to partiality of any kind, especially in spreading the gospel. Every human being is a child of God. Amen. Do we recognize that as we, that as we move through our lives and rub shoulders with others? How many of our cultural norms do we carry along with our Christianity? Do we insist that people adopt all our cultural ideas that they want to join our church? Is that really necessary? An example of how cultural ideas can impact a local church is the question of what kind of music is acceptable in the Christian church. Is it all right to play guitars and drums? Mm -hmm. Do some question that? Wow. Should we adopt... What? And banjos. And banjos. <laughs> should we adopt more modern music? Or should we stick with the old favorite hymns? How often do we make the mistake that Abraham and Sarah did and try to run ahead of God? thinking that we know what's best. And of course, when we try to run ahead of God, we sort of just naturally migrate to our, our usual customs and cultural norms. And are very often, they're not God's plan for us. Well, think of the disasters. The disaster that happened to the children of Israel when they chose a, a king. And God says, okay, I'll give you a king. Here's one, the kind you would like. And we know what kind of disaster he was. And then God says, let me choose the kind of king I want. And incredible as it may seem, he said, I'm going to choose a descendant of that king to be the king who will, last, who will live forever, ruin forever. We've run out of time, but you can find what's rest, the rest of our material under our in a handout under theox.org. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of coming together and worshiping together and reading your word together as we discuss these lessons. May they be a blessing to others just as they have been to us. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.